Matthew chapter 5, stand for the reading of the Word of God. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger, thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege that we have to preach the Word of God. We ask, Lord, for your anointing this morning. Pray that you would bless this congregation. God, you've assembled these people here in this service this morning because you desire to bless them. You desire to help us, Father. And I pray that we'd not leave here like we came. Thy divine hand would be upon our life. You'd help us to have a pure heart, Lord. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. And I want to preach to you this morning for a few minutes on the pure in heart. In this Beatitudes, Jesus is describing the sanctified character of his followers. The disciple is to have a heart like that of Christ. And the disciple of Jesus can only follow the pattern of Jesus' life if he has the purity of Jesus' heart. You understand that? I said you can only follow the pattern of Jesus' life if you have the purity of Jesus' heart. And so the Bible is teaching us here that this is absolutely essential for a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ. You must have a pure heart. And that person is blessed who is pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, there's three things. My message is that in three parts this morning, I want to talk to you about a, a, a pure heart of praise, Secondly, a pure heart appropriated. And thirdly, a pure heart approved. First of all, a pure heart appraised. The question is, what is a pure heart? The Greek word translated pure means without mixture or without alloy. And it carries the idea of no impurity. It's used in Revelation 21 to describe the gold in the New Jerusalem. That gold has no impurities. It is pure gold. In other words, it has nothing in it that would diminish its value. Nothing in it that contradicts the nature of gold. All the impurities have been removed. It is pure gold. And God says, I want you to have a heart that is pure, blessed of the pure in heart. A pure heart is that heart that's been cleansed from all impurities. One man said, a pure heart is a heart with nothing in it contrary to the love of Christ. This is what God does for us. He cleanses our heart of everything that is contrary to the love of God and makes our heart pure. The pure in heart are those saints in whom there is no inner struggle with the will of God. Their heart is fixed, as the Bible says. Their sails are set. Their doubts are settled. Their eye is single. And their will is surrendered to the will of God. The pure in heart have what we was teaching on this morning in Sunday school. They have undivided loyalty to the Lord. They love God with all of their heart. They do not share their heart with the world. They do not share their heart with idols. And I'm telling you that hell has no friend in the man with a pure heart. And cooperation with the powers of darkness is unthinkable to that man whose heart has been made pure. When a man's heart's divided, 
when his eye is roaming, when his loyalty is wavering, then Satan is ready with an offer to entice that man away from God, to turn him against God and against the people of God. On February the 21st, 1994, um, the FBI arrested a man by the name of Rick Ames. They arrested him for treason. As a young man, this he had been hired by the CIA as a spy, and he was assigned to the Soviet division. He looked at himself serving his country, he thought of himself as a patriot, loyal to his country. But after 23 years of loyal service, he began to entertain thoughts of treason against the country he once felt such loyalty to. He no longer recognized spying as being a serious and consequential occupation. He began to think of the intelligence wars, and I quote him, as mostly a silly game, adults wearing children's masks, trying to sneak peeks at each other's cards. And besides that, he and his new bride, his second wife, had expensive tastes, and a modest income. And so he decided that he would offer his services to the Soviets to increase his income and match his taste. Working within the CIA, he provided classified information to the Soviets for nine years before he was finally caught. During that time, he gave the Soviets the names of 25 spies, and of that 25, many of them were executed because they were betrayed by this man, Rick Ames. He made $2 million off of his spying and betraying his country, $2 million that were given to him and had promise of that much more when he was finally caught. He admitted after being caught that money was his primary motivation for his treason. But he had no remorse, no feelings of regret about those people that were in the grave because of what he had done. And while in prison, carrying out his sentence, he felt like he was the victim and remained bitter toward his former comrades at the CIA. When I read about this man, I thought about so many in the kingdom of God that had followed that same pattern of life. This scenario has been played out in the kingdom of God numerous times through the years. A person with unquestioned loyalty to Christ cools in his affection toward Christ, cools in his affection toward the followers of Christ, and service in the kingdom of God no longer seems to be so important, and worldly ambitions arise in that heart, corrupt the heart, and Satan sees an opening in that life, offers them something in the world, a position some pleasure or prosperity perhaps, a better job, more money, if they'll just sacrifice their principles, turn against Christ. And so they switch loyalties. And they betray the saints. And they betray Christ. And souls are destroyed. Their influence brings down others. People backslide and become embittered. I, I do not personally remember any backslider ever bemoaning the destruction left 
in the wake of their decision to leave Christ. Everyone that I've ever known of was focused on themselves. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, the Bible says. And so, they become focused on perceived wrongs done to them. Become bitter toward their former fellowship among the saints of God. This scenario has been carried out time after time because something happened in their heart that divided their heart, destroyed their loyalty to Christ. I'm telling you, brother, it is important to keep a check on your spiritual temperature because divided hearts become tragic tails down the road. So it's important that our heart be pure. A pure heart is absolutely necessary for a consistent life of holiness and righteousness. In the book of Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, the wise man says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart with all diligence. For out of that heart are the issues of life. Secondly, I want to talk to you about a pure heart appropriated. How do we obtain a pure heart? A pure heart is, is the result not of my efforts, but of divine action in my life. It has to come from God. It has to be a work of God in my life. Because a pure heart is not uh, the natural state of man. We are born with a polluted heart. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17 and 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And the Bible tells us also, Jesus describes the content of our wicked heart in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. He says, For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, which is indecent behavior, an evil eye, which is envy, blasphemy or slander, pride and foolishness. All of these evil things come from within. And Jesus said, they defile the man. These come out of the heart. Now it's obvious from this list that Christ gives to us that there are not many people that have a, a pure heart. Those people's heart is polluted. A pure heart is one that has been purged from the contamination that's common to the human race. Jesus will purge our hearts from those things that contaminate our life. No man, no man can live a life of consistent righteousness and holiness when his heart is polluted by evil desires and selfish ambitions. Proverbs 16 and 5 tells us everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Here is one thing one preacher said, that pride is the last thing out and the first thing back in. And God says that everybody that's proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And the Bible warns the Jewish Christians in James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your heart, hey, where is it at? It's in your hearts. Bitter envying and strife in your hearts. Where does it show up at? Well, it shows up on the job. It shows up in the church. It shows up at the dinner table at home. This is where it shows up. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, he said, and lie not against the truth. Don't deny it. 
You know, I've talked to people that obviously were bitter people. And to approach them about their bitterness. And they denied it vehemently. I am not bitter. Yeah. That's the way they deny it, you know. I am not bitter. Don't lie. Don't lie against the truth. Acknowledge the truth. Glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Where does this come from? It comes from the heart, brother. The damage of a divided heart is seen among the Jewish believers in James' audience. They were double-minded, unstable, had a weak prayer life, were guilty of partiality toward the wealthy. Their fellowship was turbulent due to undisciplined tongues. They, uh, with the same tongue, they blessed God and cursed or reviled their fellow man. In Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan says of the character he called talkative. How many of y'all ever read Pilgrim's Progress? All right. Some of you have. It's the rest of you ought to. Pilgrim's Progress Bunyan has a character he calls talkative. And he says this about him. He was a saint abroad and a devil at home. Now, you might have somebody like that at home, but don't tell me. A saint abroad and a devil at home. That was talkative. He could talk a good talk, but he couldn't walk a good walk. James perceives that his parishioners did not behave with the same piety at home and on the job as they did at church. And that the attitude in church business was not the same attitude that they had in church worship. You know, oh God help us. Thank God for this church. I don't know that I'm preaching to anybody here. I don't know that I am. I may be, but I don't know that I am. But we have the, the, the greatest harmony I, I've ever seen in any church, I guess, right here. And I thank God for that. But I'm telling you that if the devil can mess our hearts up, he'll mess that up, brother. And he'll cause us to do our business in a completely different attitude than what we do our worship. We can bless God with our mouth and curse our fellow man or revile our fellow man. And God says, that comes from a heart that's contaminated. He gave them this counsel. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. He said, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. There is a cure for that. And He says to them, I want you to weep and mourn about this. I don't want you rejoicing about this. I want you mourning and weeping over this until you get the cure in your heart. Purity of heart is granted to those who are distressed over the destruction in human relationships and the dishonor done to God's name because of a polluted heart. In James chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, James exhorts his damaged parishioners, listen, be afflicted, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves, therefore, in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. He will purge your heart. He'll get rid of that double mind. He'll fix you to where you've got a single eye, that you don't have a wandering eye. Your eye is single because your heart is single, and your motives have been purged. There's no church that has to live with perpetual strife. You hear me? I said there is no church that has to live with perpetual strife on the Internet. <laughs> But I'm telling you, brother, 
God will fix that in our hearts and lives. We don't have to live with that kind of strife. Thank God we can have a pure heart, love one another, love God, and live at peace one with another. Praise God. Pure heart. The fellowship between pure hearts is wonderful. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2 and 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned or genuine love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Hallelujah! Listen, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanseth us from all sin. God gave His Son, and His blood cleanses our heart from all sin, purifies our heart, and we can love people out of a pure heart fervently. The blood of Jesus is the cleansing agent. Purifies our heart. It cleanses and keeps on cleansing, keeping the heart pure. The blood of Jesus cleanseth us from all sin. And that's not just one cleansing. That blood, this is the present tense, it cleanses. It keeps on cleansing. You know, it's like a flowing river. It just keeps on washing and keeps on washing in our hearts and keeps us clean and keeps our hearts pure. Hallelujah. For that fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And God has made a way for us to have a pure heart. Augustus taught lady, contemporary John Wesley, wrote about this fountain in his immortal hymn, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. That is what the blood of Jesus does. It corrects the course of life. It cleanses the fountain of our life. It puts sweetness for bitterness. It puts Kindness in place of harshness. It puts uh, tenderness in place of hardness. And it puts humility in the place of haughtiness. A pure heart. A pure heart is the foundation of a consistent life of holiness and righteousness. Now I'll ask you a question. Could you say with confidence this morning, My heart is pure. My loyalty to Christ and His church is unwavering. I have been to Calvary for the cleansing work in my heart, and my heart is pure. Finally, I want to talk to you about a pure heart approved. The Bible says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall See God. These people have access to God. The pure in heart. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6 says, Who shall ascend into the heel of the Lord? Who shall stand in His holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy faith. Who is going to be able to worship God? Who is to stand in the, his holy place? The pure in heart are the ones that are qualified to ascend into the heel of the Lord and to stand in His holy place. Their worship is not mechanical. Their worship is not routine. It is heartfelt. Their hearts are pure. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. He said, You hypocrites, 
Well, did Isaiah or Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and honors me with their lips, but the heart is far from me, he says. Brother, I don't want that to be said about me. And I've known people that I felt like that was true of them. They could talk a good talk. They could talk much religion. But their heart was far from God. God wants us to have a pure heart. You can only worship God like you need to worship God if your heart is pure. Those are the ones qualified to worship Jesus. When your heart is really in it, when you really love God with all your heart, when there's nothing in your heart that contradicts the love of God, when your heart is not divided, when your mind and your heart is set on one thing, doing the will of God. God not only approves the worship of the pure in heart, but listen to me, He hears the appeal of the pure in heart. Polluted hearts offer up polluted prayers. James chapter 4 and verse 3 tells us that these Jewish believers with the double mind and the divided heart were praying, but they were not receiving. And James exposes their problem. He said, you ask amiss. And that word amiss means with evil intent, that you may consume it upon your own lust. In other words, their petitions were for their own personal profit and not for God's glory. You remember David saying in Psalms chapter 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Did you understand that? If your heart's polluted, if you regard iniquity in your heart, have you been wondering why your prayers are not answered? It may be that there is something in your heart that is keeping you from getting a prayer through to God. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Then he adds this statement. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. In other words, David said, I know my heart's pure because God has heard and answered my prayers. Pure heart transform the atmosphere of worship and they make prayer more than just an exercise of futility. Brother, if this church values the presence of God and if we value answers to prayer, I tell you what we'll value. We'll value purity of heart. Because only if we are pure in heart can we have the presence of God and God will hear our appeals in prayer. When our hearts are pure and we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, God, that that, that person who is pure in heart, they shall see God. They have access unto the throne of God. God values the pure in heart and He promises blessings upon them. Blessed are the pure in heart. Some of you may remember this man, King Asa. God rebuked him. He was a good king for most of his reign, but he failed to trust God in a crisis. Hired the king of Syria to come and help him. Instead of trusting in God, after God had done such wonderful things for him, he made an alliance with a heathen king for his help. And God sent a prophet to him to rebuke him because he failed to trust in God. And this is what the prophet told him. He said, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. In other words, he told Asa, Asa, if your heart had been perfect toward God, if you'd have had a pure heart, if you'd have kept trusting in God, he was looking for somebody that he could show himself strong strong in their behalf. And I'll say the eyes of the Lord are still running to and fro in this earth, looking for somebody whose heart is perfect toward Him, that He may show Himself strong in their behalf. 
I'm telling you, brother, it don't make me shiver and shake when we run up against challenges in the church or in my personal life. Because I know what God has done in the past. And if my heart is perfect toward Him, God is looking for somebody He can show Himself strong in their behalf. Hallelujah! Praise God. Oh, we got, we've got a, you know, we got a project going here, and, and it's going to require a whole lot of money. A lot more money than we've got. I don't know, you know, I don't know how much money all of y'all have got. But I'm telling you, it's going to take a whole lot of money to do what we need to do. But thank God, and I believe it's the will of God. And God has assured us in our hearts that we're doing what He wants done. And this is, needs to be done for the house of God. And I'm confident that what God's done in the past, God will do again. If our hearts are perfect toward Him, if we're pure in heart, if we're doing it for His glory, if this is our aim to lift up the name of Jesus, further the cause of the kingdom of God, somebody, He can show Himself strong in their behalf. When you trust Him, brother, when your heart is pure, when you look to God in time of crisis, when your faith does not waver because your heart is pure, God is looking for somebody to show Himself strong in their behalf. God has done great things for us. I'm telling you, God's done great things for us. And I've been feeling, I've told you some time back, I've been feeling like that we're just standing on the verge of something awesome in the kingdom of God. Sister Lenore testified that same thing the other night, and I felt the Holy Ghost confirm that in my heart. I still feel that in my spirit that God wants to do something awesome right here in this congregation. I tell you what, brother and sister, if we value a pure heart, if we will come to God and say, God, cleanse my heart. I want you to cleanse motives and my desires, that my motives are pure. I only want your glory and your honor in my life. My life be centered around Christ and not myself. And I want you to set my priorities right. I'm telling you, brother, God will do great things in your life, in your family, and in this church because He's looking for somebody. He can show Himself Strong in their behalf, brother. I'm going to try to wind this down, Sister Judy, if you'll come to the piano. When God was looking for a man to sit on the throne of Israel, when Saul had failed God, God looked for a certain kind of man. He looked for a man after his own heart. He found a man like that, in David, David was a man after God's own heart. And God told Samuel, when Samuel went to the place of, of worship, sacrifice, called Jesse's family, because God had chosen a boy in that family, they paraded before Samuel, and Samuel saw him, tall, strong, manly. He was ready to pull the oil on him, the eldest, the second, the third. And God said, no, no, no. And finally, when all of them had come by, and as Samuel said, you got any more? And he said, yeah, I got one. He's over there on the backside, keeping the sheep, send for him. Stripling of a lad comes up there. God says, that's the man I'm looking for. You pull the oil on him. And God said this, man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? God looks on the heart. Pull all on that boy. It wasn't but a few days till Goliath was challenging the armies of Israel. These boys that God had rejected were in that army. And David was sent down there with food for them, and they wouldn't answer the challenge of Goliath. But when David heard the challenge of Goliath, he said, I'll go fight him. Who is this uncircumcised to defy the armies of the living God? I'm telling you, brother, God had already seen in that boy's heart. He knew what kind of heart that boy had. When you've got a pure heart, you're willing to face the devil in the name of Jesus. Fight the battles for the Lord whenever you've got a pure heart. And David said, I'll fight him. Oh, I said, you can't. You're, you're, you're inexperienced. You're too little. You're too young. 
Are y'all hearing me, young folks? Oh, listen to me now. God has done wonderful things with young folks that had a pure heart and the anointing of God on them. And here was David with a pure heart and the anointing of God on him. He said, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. And God will deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands as well. He went out and God gave him the victory. Listen to me now, brother and sister. There's been many a man that's known victories like that in the past that did like David, who after years of success, after defeating foes, after ruling with wisdom, took God's blessings for granted and gave his heart to sinful lust. God uncovered David's sin, pronounced judgment on him, and David cried out to God in Psalm 51 for God's loving kindness and forgiveness. He requested something from God that only God can give. He said, Create in me a clean heart, O God. This is the creation of God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Hey, listen to me, brother. This is what David was asking for. Give me the kind of heart I had when I qualified for the throne. Give me the heart that made me, make me what I once was. Give me that same kind of heart again. Create in me a clean heart. That's the creation of God, brother and sister. You don't do that. God does that. He reaches down to the very fountains of our lives, the very foundations of our lives, sets it right at the very foundation of life. He cleanses our heart. He sanctifies us. He gives us a foundation for righteousness and holiness. There's an urgency here. I'm telling you, there's an urgency here. We need God's favor on this church. We need God's favor on our families. We need God's favor upon our individual lives. And God has pronounced a blessing upon the pure in heart. Blessed, favored of God are the pure in heart. And listen to me, brother and sister. We're working against the deadline. And we cannot afford to be without divine blessing. And we must remember that Jesus is soon coming back and the pure in heart are going to see him. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, Beloved, now we the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. This is the hope of God's people. Jesus is coming back. And we are purifying ourselves, even as he is pure. A sonic boom from a meteor the size of a bus exploding over the Ural Mountains in Russia this week with the force of 20 atomic bombs reminded us forcefully that the end is near. And on that same day, an asteroid passed between the earth and the moon closer than any we've ever seen before or known of before, and it made us realize we're living in a dangerous neighborhood in space. And the prophecy in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 13, the stars of heaven fell to the earth, as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That prophecy seems more real to us this morning than it did a week ago. And I want to ask you a question. We're bumping up against the coming of the Lord. And I wonder if there's anybody in this place that's interested in a pure heart. That's my question. That's my question. 
for anybody in this place interested in a pure heart. Oh God, create in me a clean heart, a pure heart. Anybody want to pray? Anybody interested in the favor of God? Anybody conscious of the fact that only the pure in heart are going to see God? Anybody interested in the fact that Jesus is soon coming? And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure.